Hello friends. Today we are going to discuss about legal aspects of informed consent. I am Dr. Suresh Bhadadmat, Professor of Psychiatry, working at National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences, Bangalore. In this video, I will be discussing about ethical and legal aspects of informed consent. What are the legal issues with regard to blanket consent versus procedure specific consent? whether the patients have right to refuse treatment during the informed consent? Are there any case studies or case laws with regard to pre-printed consent forms? Whether the consent for diagnosis be extended to intervention or else is there a different consent form for diagnosis or for therapy? If you use the consent for extended procedure, is it allowed? All these issues will be discussed in this video. Please do remember, this video is the legal aspects of informed consent from Indian judiciary perspective, my dear friends. Let's understand what is consent. Consent means permission or agreement or approval. This is the dictionary meaning. In simple words, it can be considered as permission for something to happen or agreement to do something or to agree to something or give your permission for something. This is what the consent means. However, the consent from healthcare perspective differs slightly from the obligation and liability. Examination of a patient to diagnose, to treat, to operate on a patient without the patient consent amounts to assault in law, even if it is beneficial and done in good faith for the patient. That means, if a physician does some operation on a patient, and this decision is in the best interest of the patient, but the patient has not given consent. That means the doctor is liable under medical negligence. The doctor may be charged for negligence if he fails to give the required information to the patient before obtaining his consent to a particular interventional procedure. All this clearly indicates the role of valid consent in medical practice, my dear friends. Let's understand the law of consent. In this consent, we need to understand from two perspectives. This is my own classification. Here, the consent that is substantial law of consent, that is principle behind the consent and the procedure of taking consent. These are the two important aspects which are considered in the court of law. Whether the principle behind the consent was fulfilled, whether the procedure was completed. Let's understand. Consent is perhaps the only principle that runs through all aspects of healthcare provisions today. It also represents that the legal and ethical expression of the basic rights to have one's autonomy and self-determination. That means the basic foundation of bioethics is autonomy and self-determination of the patients. Here in bioethics it's clearly said autonomy is the basis of informed consent which includes truth-telling and confidentiality. Autonomy means all persons have intrinsic and unconditional worth and therefore should have the power to make rational decisions and moral choices and each should be allowed to exercise his or her capacity for self-determination. Here, this principle of autonomy is enshrined in the Article 21 of Constitution of India. 
which deals with right to life and liberty. Here, the expression of right to life and liberty is widened by the Supreme Court. It has the widest amplitude and covers wide variety of rights, such as right to consent for treatment, right to refuse for treatment, right to live with the dignity, right to die with the dignity, and all this goes along with it. That's where the Supreme Court of India has clearly articulated this further. Earlier, this informed consent was in the ethical domain. For a period of time, the healthcare providers refused to take informed consent. The paternalistic attitude continued. Hence, many of the legislation which are enacted recently, such as Mental Health Care Act of 2017, has defined informed consent. That means, it has moved out from ethical arena to legal arena. Similarly, HIV and AIDS Protection and Control Act of 2017 also has defined informed consent. Further, the legislation such as Transplantation of Human Organs and Tissues Act of 1994, New Drugs and Clinical Trials Rule 2019, Assisted Production Reproduction Technology Act 2021, and Surrogacy Act of 2021. All these have clearly defined informed consent in the legislation and which are ingrained even in the rules. Let's understand the procedural part of the informed consent. It may be implied consent or expressed consent. Implied means by the virtue of patient seeking help, goes to the hospital, enters into the doctor, doctor's chamber, with his own will may be considered as an implied consent for outpatient basis treatment. What is expressed consent? Here, if the patient has to undergo a certain examination, which is not routine, the doctor may have to take oral consent, that means verbal consent. In certain surgical procedure, written consent is very essential. Many a time, the procedure may be lengthy. Hence, pre-printed consent forms are made available in the hospitals. Now, in the, in the era of digital world, video-based, audio-based, multimedia-based consent is taken. It is not far. Chat GPT can be used for administering informed consent, which will provide a standard information with regard to the diagnosis, the procedure, risk, benefits involved, course and outcome and also what will be the outcome of the proposed treatment will be told by the chat GPT. Hence, over a period of time, AI, artificial intelligence and chat GPT can become the landmark instrumental tool for informed consent administration. Let's look into the legal redressal for violation of informed consent. That is, diagnosing or treating a patient without consent. If a medical practitioner attempts to treat a person without valid consent, then he will be liable under both civil law and criminal law. Here, civil law is nothing but tort law. Tort is a civil wrong for which the aggrieved party may seek compensation from the wrongdoer. The consequences would be the payment of compensation in civil or else imprisonment in criminal law. Further, if the complaint reaches the professional body or else medical counsel, the license to practice medicine can be cancelled. A medical intervention without a valid informed consent is a criminal offence and the physician can be charged with battery. Based on the injury and the outcome, it can be simple injury, grievous injury, death, the charges can be framed against the doctor. Let's understand the legal protection after taking consent. Under the Indian Penal Code, Penal Code there are certain rescue clause. The healthcare provider can save himself 
from criminal liability if they follow Indian Penal Code 1860 and take informed consent. As per Indian Penal Code Section 87, let's understand that act not intended and not known to be likely to cause death or grievous hurt done by consent. That means if you are doing an operation with fully informed consent and there is a negative outcome, the doctor will not be charged under Section 87. Similarly, Indian Penal Code Section 88 Act not intended to cause death done by consent in good faith for person's benefit. Again here, the doctor will not be charged under Section 88. Section 89 Act done in good faith for benefit of the child or insane person by or by consent of the guardian will not be considered under Section 89. That means consent has been ingrained under Indian Penal Code, my dear friends. Let's understand the ingredients of informed consent. All informations which are provided during the informed consent should have non-medical terms as far as possible and preferably in patient's own language in simple terms should be explained. Let's look into the important elements of informed consent. First and the foremost is nature of the diagnosis, proposed treatment or procedure, what are the alternatives available, the risks and benefits of the proposed treatment, alternative treatment, if the person refuses treatment, what are the risks and benefits, relative chances of success or failure of the above needs to be discussed with the patient. Here. The information provided is contested by both the patient and also by the doctor. How much risks needs to be explained to the patient? Is it reasonable risk should be explained or else the remote risk should be explained or whether 100% compliance with regard to all risks or material risk are explained. This is the debate across the world, my dear friends. There are conventional method. In conventional method of medical doctrine, the doctors will withhold significant information considering it will harm the patient. That means the patient may have anxiety, fear of a suggested medical procedure. He may refuse treatment or else it may impact his mental health status of the diagnosis if he is given or the intervention proposed. Hence the doctor used to decide that he will tell the information based upon the requirement. It is a common practice not to tell a patient they were dying and even to deny the information. Many practitioners over a period of time revealed only information that another physician provided in a similar situation that is called as professional standard of disclosure. This is based upon Bolam's test, my dear friend. This is where conventional method from paternalistic attitude to the Bolam test came into picture. However, in the contemporary world, it is Canterbury method is approved. That is reasonably prudent patient test, also called as reasonable patient test. And invariably, it is also called as real consent. A risk should be disclosed if it is material. And it is material when a reasonable person in what physician knows or should know to be the patient position would be likely to attach significance to the risk or the cluster of risks in deciding whether or not to forego the proposed therapy. Consent, consent should be based on the basis of adequate information concerning the nature of treatment procedure so that the patient who is consenting should know all aspects of the procedure so that he can take informed consent. Let's discuss about pre-printed consent forms. During the hospitalization, that is during admission, pre-printed consent forms are given to the patient 
and patient family members. They are asked to sign. They are asked to sign in various places of the patient file. These are pre-printed blanket consent form. Further, there are pre-printed consent form for diagnostic procedure and also for treatment. Later, now the era has come, pre-printed intervention specific informed consent. Now the question is, consent is taken in a standard consent form. That is, a pre-printed consent form circulated among all the professionals. They take the signature from the patient or the patient party. Whether it is legally acceptable, is it valid under the law, is a big question. Let's understand what is this pre-printed blanket consent form. Here in the blanket consent form, it is a consent taken on a printed form that covers, that is a, like a blanket, it covers almost everything a doctor or a hospital might do to a patient without men mentioning anything specifically regarding the diagnostic procedure or the interventional procedure. Blanket, blanket consent is legally inadequate for any procedure that has risks or alternative not mentioned. It becomes invalid simply because it does not fulfill the principle behind the consent or else substantial law behind the consent is not fulfilled. This, this is how the blanket consent form looks. Let's read it. These are the blanket consent form given to the patient or the patient party during admission. This is how it goes. I, Mr. So and So, son of So and So, aged, do hereby give my consent for admission to the hospital, investigations, treatment and rehabilitation purposes. I have been informed about all the risks involved during my admission, investigation and treatment. If any untoward incident do occur during my hospital stay, I will not hold doctor or the treating team or the hospital responsible for the same. I agree to pay all cost and expense, expenses incurred in connection with my health care. Signature of the patient, legal guardian and the hospital staff. Here it is blanket. The reason being is admission for any ward, admission for any diagnostic procedure, treatment for any interventional procedure is a blanket it is given. It is no explanation is given. It is like signing on a blanket paper. Let's look at the pre-printed consent form. How does it look? This is how it looks. Let's divide this consent form into two parts so that we can examine. This is the upper part of the informed consent, which has patient name and medical record number. Here this form is printed. If you look at closely, the serial number one clay says, so and so physician has explained to me that I have a following condition. That is, diagnosis is written here. The following procedure, intervention, anesthesia has been recommended. Now, there is a blank space. You will write the procedure and anesthesia. Further, if you look at the item number four, the following have been explained to me about the procedure, intervention, anesthesia, its purpose and nature, benefit and risk, the likely risk if do not recommend the, do not have rec recommended procedure intervention, the available alternatives, the most likely and most serious risk of the procedures are also mentioned. And now, here the patient standard format is there, he will sign. That means, in the whole printed informed consent, there is a place to write the clinician name, patient name, the diagnosis, the procedure specified. Rest of the whole consent form is a standard to any diagnosis or intervention or admission. Hence, this kind of pre-printed consent form is questionable in the court of law. Hence, there was a recent case with regard to pre-printed consent form. 
Hence, the National Consumer Forum, a case of pre printed forms, reached there. Let's discuss about that. Vinod Khanna versus RJ Stone, Urology and Laparoscopic Hospital. This case will be discussed now. In January 2010, Mr. X, 65 year old patient, was suffering from pain, abdomen, and difficulty in passing urine. Hence, in the early morning hour, he went to Fortis Hospital. There, they inserted the catheter and drained the urine. Mr. X also had prior history of surgery of hernia, appendix with history of tuberculosis and acquired immune, immune deficiency syndrome that is HIV along with cryptococcal meningitis and Kaposi's sarcoma in the past. As in the Fortis hospital, the pain abdomen was relieved by catheterization. Since the patient was poor and because of financial difficulties, he approached Dr. Anil at the RJ Stone Urology and Laparoscopy Hospital. He was admitted, investigation done and operational procedure was planned for multiple abscess and benign prostatic hypertrophy. After the operation, catheter was placed in the bladder for 5 days. After 3 days, the patient complained that he had started passing urine from the rectum instead of the urethra. That was immediately after the surgery. The doctor advised for natural healing and reinsertion of catheter was done for 6 weeks. The patient became apprehensive, anxious and he reached another hospital that is Indraprastha Apollo Hospital and got further treatment there for about 3 months. But again it, this did not cure. Hence again he reverted to Fortis Hospital. In the Fortis Hospital they have clearly mentioned no urine per rectula, rectum and fistula is healed. But however the patient was not happy. Hence in 2017, that is, after 8 years of the surgery, the patient complained to the State Consumer Dispute Readdressal Commission with allegation that he is still urinating in the rectum and he had spent 3,50,000 and he has been regularly visiting Fortis Hospital. Hence, he should be compensated with 1.9 crore compensation. This was the request done by the patient in the court of law against the hospital. State commission condoned the delay for approaching, that is after 8 years. Hence, the case was disposed telling on the ground of lack of pecuniary jurisdiction, we don't accept this case. Even the doctors and the hospital also condoned the delay. But however, the patient approached National Commission and the National Commission took the case. The expert opinion was also taken from Medical Board of Maulana Azad Medical College. The Maulana Azad Medical College clearly reported that they did not find any deficiency in services or medical negligence in this case. They appreciated the doctor that they operated a HIV patient who was suffering from benign prostatic hypertrophy along with multiple abscess because of HIV. And they said there was no deficiency. National Consumer Forum also found there was no deficiency in services or medical negligence on the part of the doctor. However, National Consumer Commission made some serious observation on pre-printed consent form which were produced in front of the Consumer Forum. The National Consumer Forum gave this judgment. They said doctors are not negligent but a pre-printed 
and fixed inform consent come undertaking form with blank spaces for limited selected handwritten entries and for the signature has been used the main body of the form is preprinted and fixed it can fit into any procedure any doctor any patient after filling up the blank spaces for the limited select handwritten entries and getting affixing the signatures we note this to be an administrative arbitrariness and one sided high handedness and to be unfair trade practice and deceptive on the part of the hospital national consumer commission imposed 10 lakh rupees fine on the hospitals for using preprinted preprinted consent form and said that it is unfair trade practice but the same court also said doctors were not considered negligent so my dear friends this is a landmark judgment by the national consumer commission but however the hospital and doctors have appealed to the supreme court the supreme court has given the stay order in 2020 and hence the preprinted consent form are still used across the india and let's understand from the academic purpose whether the national consumer commission was right or wrong this is purely on academic discussion my dear friends you are all doctors healthcare professionals you need to understand the principle behind the decision in this case healthcare providers have completed the procedure of taking signature on the forms but the substantial law the principle behind the informed consent was not fulfilled and it was not documented here you may take signature on any any piece of paper or on any preprinted forms you need to explain the procedure you need to explain the risks and benefits alternative treatments if you refuse treatment what are the outcomes if you accept the treatment what are the risks and outcome should be discussed and documented this is called as informed consent my dear friends however this is still sub judice it is in the apex court but however let's understand procedure specific consent form have been discussed and dealt in the supreme court of india my dear friends let's look at that those discussion consent for diagnosis versus intervention a landmark judgment by supreme court of india that is samira kohli versus dr prabha manchanda in 2008 in this case ms samira kohli 44 year old unmarried lady reported to dr prabha with prolonged menstrual bleeding and abdominal pain dr prabha manchanda examined her did ultrasound abdomen and found there is a possibility of endometriosis hence she explained and requested to come tomorrow for laparoscopic examination under general anesthesia next day ms samira kohli visited the clinic and consented to undergo diagnostic and operative laparoscopy further in the consent form it was also mentioned a laparotomy may be needed ms samira kohli was put under general anesthesia and laparoscopic examination was done in laparoscopy they will put a small hole in the abdomen and through a pipe they will visualize what is happening inside the abdomen and they found she was suffering from grade 4 endometriosis almost frozen pelvis was there the doctor decided to go for complete radical surgery to treat endometriosis hence the doctor assistant latha r went outside explained the mother about the grade 4 endometriosis and need for hysterectomy and bilateral salpingo oophorectomy mother gave consent so that the radical cure can be done 
Hence, bilateral sulfingophorectomy and hysterectomy was performed. When Miss Samira Kohli came out of the anesthesia and when she came to know about the hysterectomy, she became disheartened and she fought with the doctor and left the clinic without paying the bill. Dr. Prabha Manchanda also was upset because they did not pay the bill. And she gave a police complaint alleging that Miss Samira Kohli and her friend had visited the hospital, took treatment and threatened us and did not pay the hospital bill. And that FIR was lodged. A counter FIR was done by Miss Samira Kohli regarding the case, telling that they removed her uterus without consent. And the case was also lodged in National Consumer Dispute Redressal Commission claiming compensation of 25 lakh rupees. This was the case, my dear friends. Miss Samira Kohli accused Dr. Prabha Manchanda had been negligent in treating her and performed hysterectomy and bilateral salfingo oophorectomy without her consent. After hearing arguments from both sides, the National Consumer Dispute Redressal Commission dismissed the complaint. But however, she again appealed to the Supreme Court. Here, the National Consumer Forum clearly said that Prabha Manchanda was not at deficiency of services. She did what is best to the patient. It was in the best interest of the patient to do this cure treatment. Tomorrow or day after tomorrow, she would have required this hysterectomy because it was grade 4 endometriosis. But however, the Supreme Court, after hearing the case, came up with a landmark verdict. Let's discuss this. The Supreme Court observed that Ms. Samira Kohli gave signature on the consent form for surgery which stated that diagnostic and operative laparoscopy. It was also stated that laparotomy may be needed. There was no expressed consent for abdominal hysterectomy and bilateral salfingo oophorectomy. In any of the consent form, she had not signed for this. And this was not an emergency surgery. The Supreme Court held the doctor is liable for malpractice. Consent was given only for a diagnostic procedure, that is, laparoscopy and laparotomy. Under no circumstances, the diagnostic procedure can be extended for therapeutic surgery. Consent for a specific treatment procedure will not be valid for conducting some other treatment procedure. The consent given for diagnostic procedure is not valid for therapeutic procedure. Hence, procedure-specific consent is essential. That's what the Supreme Court said. The Supreme Court held that however beneficial to the patient in saving the time, expenses, pain and suffering, additional surgery is no ground for defense in elective surgical procedure. That means, the doctor argued telling that Samira Kohli should have, would have undergone one more operation. She would have paid some more money, some more time is wasted. Hence, I did this surgery in a single setting. Supreme Court said that under elective surgery, this is not allowed. The, judge, the judgment further differentiated between informed consent and real consent. Apex Court consciously referred for real consent in India. That is, reasonable physician test or BOLAM test should be used for informed consent. And they rejected the reasonable prudent patient test of Canterbury in India. The final verdict was like this. Even assuming the radical surgery, surgery was needed, but it was not immediate. That was, there was a reasonable certainty that she would likely require this surgery later for complete cure. But it was not emergency. It was elective surgery. 
on the facts and circumstances apex court considered that in the interest of justice following verdict was given the doctor should be punished hence they should be denied of the fees of the surgery and further a token of fine was placed on the doctor 25000 rupees was fined the main reason being here is the doctor although acted in the best interest of the patient but the consent was not taken that is the whole essence of the verdict my dear friends now let's understand about the consent for additional procedures or also called as extended consent form consent taken for laparotomy may not give permission for the doctor to do radical procedures however if you are able to anticipate possible prior diagnosis or differential diagnosis and you can explain the patient and the procedures which can be done for example if the patient has reported with abdominal pain especially from the right iliac region the doctor has diagnosed either appendicitis polycystitis or abscess from the psoas and he proposes laparotomy and during the laparotomy if he finds appendicitis he will remove the appendix that means he will do appendicectomy and what are the risk and benefit involved in that he will explain if he finds inflamed gallbladder he will do polycystectomy what are the risk and benefits and if there is abscess he will do the draining of the abscess or else there is a possibility one or two conditions may be there in the same patient and he has anticipated he has explained the patient such consent will stand as a valid for additional procedure only if the doctor has explained the patient regarding all the procedures please remember consent given only for diagnostic procedure is valid for diagnosis not for intervention or surgical procedure consent given for specific treatment procedure will not be valid for conducting some other procedure my dear friends any additional procedures may be performed without consent will be considered as battery my dear friends an additional procedure can be done only if it is an emergency situation my dear friends i'll give an example if the patient has severe pain in the right iliac region the doctor has proposed the possible conditions and he has said if there is an appendicitis i will remove appendix when he opens the abdomen through laparotomy and he finds there appendix is inflamed appendicitis is there but there is a tumor also is there now the doctor may take a specimen or else a sample from the tumor without doing a radical procedure although this is not an emergency hence he cannot do radical procedure however if he finds there is an abscess which is about to rupture and if he does not do operation now the patient may die shortly if there is a rupture in such a scenario of an emergency situation extended procedures are allowed but not for elective surgery or that surgery can be postponed cannot be done now they are not considered as emergency my dear friends let's look into consent for illegal procedures there can be no valid consent for operations or procedures which are illegal for example if the patient says please give me morphine please give me ketamine until i pass out or die even if it is a valid consent and there is no indication for such procedure then that informed consent becomes null and void null and void in the face of law my dear friends consent for illegal acts such as criminal abortion is invalid or helping the people to conceal drugs for trafficking through operations will be considered as illegal and the doctor will be arrested even though the doctor may say i have taken informed consent consent is no defense in case of professional negligence also my dear friends let's understand whether there is a right to refuse treatment when informed consent is given there was a landmark judgment with regard to 
euthanasia and mercy killing was re, was taken by apex court of india that is common cause versus union of india in 2018 on 9th march of 2018 the supreme court gave a landmark verdict making the way for passive euthanasia the judgment also paved the way for the terminally ill patient to seek death through passive euthanasia that is living will apex court also declared that an adult human being having a mental capacity to take informed consent decision has a right to refuse medical treatment including withdrawal from life saving devices and treatment my dear friends in this case the supreme court said that right to refuse treatment is a fundamental right patient has right to refuse treatment patient may refuse admission refuse treatment and demand discharge from the hospital to detain an adult patient against his will in the hospital is unlawful if the patient demands discharge refuses treatment refuses medical advice that should be recorded and if the patient signature can be taken is well and good and if the patient and party refuses to sign please document that also that is very important in the court of law my dear friends let's look into the consent for research consent taken for clinical research drug trial or any research involving human beings requires the guidelines from indian council of medical research should be followed otherwise it will be construed as medical misconduct with regard to investigational new drugs the rules have clearly laid out and they mandate the researcher to take video consent my dear friends to conclude the principle of autonomy is enshrined in the article 21 of constitution of india which clearly says right to life and liberty hence whenever you take consent please respect the autonomy of the patient any consent taken for diagnosis cannot be extended for intervention or surgical procedure hence intervention specific consent should be taken right to refuse treatment is a fundamental right as recognized by the supreme court of india my dear friend consent obtained should be legally valid from an adult who has mental capacity and free will should be there for his decision a doctor who treats a patient without valid consent will be liable under the tort and also under the criminal law the law presumes to doctor to be in a dominating position in a fiduciary relationship hence the consent should be obtained after providing all information to the patient so that the patient is empowered enabled so that he takes a decision which is informed so that the procedure can be done my dear friends thank you very much for your valuable time stay safe